Hi everybody, Aaron Stein here, Chief Content Officer at War on the Rocks. This is a special sneak preview of the Russia Contingency with Mike Kaufman. On this show, Mike sits down with the eminent historian of both Russian and Soviet history, Stephen Kotkin, to talk about the latest about the offensive in Ukraine, some reflections about that offensive, and what it may mean for the future of Russia and international relations. If you would like to listen to parts two and three, head on over to warontherocks.com slash membership and sign up. And with that, on to the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Russia Contingency. I'm Michael Kaufman. Today, I have a good colleague and friend who's back on the podcast. Uh, his name is Steve Kotkin. Steve is a well-known, I think, eminent historian, particularly of Stalin's regime, but not just of Stalin's regime, of Soviet history in general, of Russian history. And we've had a discussion uh, last year that I thought was a great discussion. I think it was almost around Christmas time. And I wanted to reconnect with Steve. Uh, he is currently at Stanford. And I wanted to have a conversation uh, at this stage. We're about a year and a half into this war on how see, he sees the war. Steve has commented and has offered some thoughtful analysis or insights over the course of uh, the past year and a half. He's had some prominent interviews in places like The New Yorker. I'm curious, Steve, your understanding of the war, how you see the arc of it, what do you reflect on in terms of, in terms of your comments, what you think you might have gotten right, how your views might have changed or evolved since the beginning of this war? Yeah, Mike, thanks for having me back. We've been talking pretty much the whole time for these many months about developments, about Russia's criminal aggression against Ukraine, about Ukraine's courage and ingenuity on the battlefield, and about how a Russian strategic defeat does not equal a Ukrainian victory, unfortunately. When I first started out, I noted that's right when the war happened, right? When, when the, obviously the war is nine years old, but when the wider invasion took place and Ukraine beat back the attempt to take its capital, uh, which was clearly a fantastic achievement. There was a lot of discussion about shortcuts, how we would get a quicker end to the war. You know, the three big shortcuts were the Russian army would disintegrate in the battlefield because this was a, a colonial war of aggression and they weren't into it. And there was a criminal regime and the morale was really low and there was corruption in the ranks. And so this, this thing couldn't hold. It would disintegrate. And if the Russian army disintegrated in the field, Ukraine could evict them from all occupied territory, including what they occupied before February 2022. The problem with this, of course, there was no evidence that the Russian army was disintegrating in the field, despite all the trouble that they had. The second shortcut we, we focused on at the early stage was, you know, the Putin regime would unravel. He was really unpopular. The popularity was a fake. Uh, there would be, uh, the war was not a happy one, especially when it didn't go well right at the beginning. And therefore, elites would somehow remove him, overthrow him, conspire against him, or he would just commit so many mistakes that he would unravel his own regime. Right? So the, the problem with that second shortcut, was, once again, there was no evidence that any of that was going on. And then the third shortcut was the Chinese would step in here, exert leverage, over Putin and get him to back down because it made the Chinese look bad. And the problem with that argument was that we didn't know Chinese intentions, but more importantly, they didn't have any leverage because they weren't supplying Russia with significant uh, weaponry. And at that time with very little dual use equipment even. And so there was no evidence across the three shortcuts. And so I argued at the very beginning that Ukraine would have to win this on the battlefield. And that would be a heavy lift. We had, of course, the events around Kharkiv, where Ukraine was able to take territory back, and that led people once again to believe that victory was in sight, that the Ukrainians could do this, that the only issue was ramping up supply of military equipment on their side uh, more quickly and a uh, greater volume, right? But that's turned out also not to be true. As I noticed that people accepted that the shortcuts weren't happening, and as I noticed 
that the euphoria over the Kharkiv operations by Ukraine, uh, as I noticed that that euphoria was dissipating, I began to change my interventions to focus less on the three shortcuts, which now everybody understood were not happening so quickly, and less on the uh, battlefield euphoria stuff, and more on winning the peace. And I began to talk about not just winning the war, but winning the peace, meaning you need something to endure over the generations, right? Mike, you, you may win some territory today, and then what happens next year? And what happens five years from now? And what happens 10 years from now? How do you achieve an enduring settlement? In other words, how do you win the peace? And so we saw in U.S. and Iraq, and especially in Afghanistan, that you could win the war and maybe lose the peace. Or at least, uh, certainly in the Afghanistan case, in the Iraq case, you could argue that its jury is still out. You could also argue that in Vietnam, the U.S. won the war. Not by the war. It lost the actual war, but then it won the peace in the fullness of time. Because despite having to withdraw, being humiliated, and the North Korean, the North Vietnamese taking Saigon, nonetheless, today, Vietnam is one of the most pro-American countries you can visit. So despite the losing of the war on the battlefield, the U.S. was able to win the peace in Vietnam. So you can not only win the war and lose the peace, you can lose the war and win the peace in the fullness of time. The fullness of time is a hard argument in a new cycle. It's a hard argument in an impatient culture, in a social media environment. It's just a hard argument to make that you got to focus on winning the peace. But I began to press on that argument, which of course brings up the need for some type of political settlement. And now we gingerly discuss Crimea, for example. Right. The argument on the Ukrainian side is that this is a just war against the criminal aggression, and they deserve every piece of their territory back, and the ability to impose war crimes tribunals and reparations on Moscow. And at an emotional level, you can't disagree with that, given the facts, given what we've seen, given what we know. At the same time, how would you enact that? Are you going to march on Moscow and impose the peace that way? Are you going to impose reparations and war, uh, war crimes tribunals in Moscow? How are you going to pull that off? It was unclear beyond the emotional level how that was a satisf satisfactory, attainable understanding of winning the peace. So I began to say, well, let's take Crimea. The argument of Crimea is if you don't get the Russians out of Crimea, they can use it to attack you again in the future. And so, therefore, it's just critical to Ukrainian security that they get Crimea back. And I said, okay, can Russia attack Ukraine again in the future from Russian territory? Yes. Okay, so, I mean, how decisive is regaining Crimea from Russia, internationally recognized Ukrainian territory? And, and, and that's where the arguments on their side dissipated a little bit. And then I brought up the following. If you take Crimea back, how does that settle matters? What happens in the future when another Russian government comes along in five years or 10 years or 25 years and decides that Crimea is actually Russian territory since 1783? And you end up taking a piece of territory that supposedly is going to end the war for you, but only makes a generational grievance grudge. That can come up again and again. And let's remember, Boris Yeltsin demanded Crimea back. In fact, even before the Soviet Union collapsed, he demanded Crimea back from, for the Russian Federation in those end-time negotiations to try to save the Soviet Union. Uh, Navalny has called. Navalny, who is Alexei Navalny, who is in prison, uh, one of the leaders of the Russian opposition, he's called Crimea Russian territory. And he's an opponent of the Putin regime. So I said, okay, so you're going to win the piece that way, but two more pieces on Crimea, and then we'll get back to you here. The other two pieces are, are you going to ethnically cleanse the Russian, the Russians from Crimea? I mean, there's two million plus Russians in Crimea. You're going to ethnically cleanse them the way the Russians ethnically cleansed the Crimean Tatars during the Stalin era? I don't know if that's a good way 
to manage to win the peace. But if you don't ethnically cleanse them, Mike, then you have 2 million plus people available for an insurgency against the Ukrainian state, inside the Ukrainian state. And if you were a devious uh, Russian ruler, you can find a lot of people, 10,000, 15,000 among 2 million, 5,000, who might be party to a perpetual insurgency, right, on, on what it would then be Ukrainian state territory. So I'm not saying that taking Crimea back was a bad idea. I was just saying, let's discuss it within the parameters of winning the peace, not just winning the war. So this, this brings us now to your area, right, our, our, our counteroffensive that's currently underway. It brings us back to the battlefield where it needs to be won on the battlefield because the shortcuts don't seem to be operative here. And we have little sense of what a deal could look like from either side, although we, we um, are waiting to see the outcome of the counteroffensive. And one of the big questions looking at this offensive right now is how much of Western strategy and Western policy is really premised on the outcome of this offensive. I wrote about this with colleague Rob Lee back in May for Foreign Affairs, basically an article titled Beyond the Offensive. And the main criticism I think we had of Western strategy is that it heavily hinged on this offensive, and this offensive was not going to resolve the war, right? Now, there were commentators out there who said that that it was going to be a lot easier than it looks, that Ukrainian forces were going to drive like a hot knife through butter, and that Russian defenses were quite brittle. And they kind of saw the prospect to repeat what was going to happen at Kharkiv. I think seasoned analysts had been writing going all the way back to the winter based on what they saw happening in Kherson and how difficult that fight was, that this offensive would be a costly and difficult proposition, that it would likely be fitful in terms of progress, that Ukrainian forces faced a daunting task against a well-prepared defense, that Russian military had higher density of forces. They weren't on the wrong side of the river this time, the way they were in Kherson, and they weren't thinly manned lined with actually fewer, much fewer Russian regulars, as was the case in Kharkiv. And so the circumstances were different, right? Each, each battle is its own in, in some respects. What happened early on, I actually don't think it was very surprising to a lot of analysts in terms of their expectations, what they anticipated, although I was cautiously optimistic Ukrainian forces would make greater progress, largely based on the assumption that the Russian military might be weaker after their own failed winter offensive. But being frank that we were looking at a relatively untested force because the Ukrainian military was going to employ a host of new brigades that were trained and equipped by the West, but in a very small amount of time. And we hadn't seen units like this previously being employed in the fight. And also that the Russian defense had been untested, but the Russian military had extensive time to entrench. And we did not know what all of that was going to amount to. Well, my assumption was that it would, it would create a real obstacle to to an advance and also being cognizant of the fact that it wasn't clear what the state of either side's forces were and it's hard to account for soft factors you know what we call the intangibles the the things that we can't count because if we could count them steve we would have called them intangibles right if there was an easy way to measure morale or things of that nature the way you count tanks you could assign numbers to them and and it'd be a solid empirical basis but unfortunately we're often stuck with anecdotes impressions and and uh, snapshots from from parts of the front. Okay, all that being said, the initial offensive hadn't gone to plan, right? Ukraine switched to an attritional approach. It's been grinding through Russian lines, a couple hundred meters, kilometer at a time, steadily pushing through in the south. But so far, the advance has netted maybe about 10 kilometers in any direction you look at, whether it's the main axis from Arikiv or the, or the supporting axes. It's not done yet. And uh, I think we're still going to see fighting going through the end of August into September. I'm not necessarily sure when it will culminate or if maybe one axis will culminate, let's say the south, while the fighting will continue around Bakhmut. That is, it's a bit, it's a bit early to, to write the story for this offensive. All right. That said, it is clear, though, at this point that the offensive operation at, at this stage 
isn't going to dramatically reverse the current situation in this war. It's not necessarily going to get Ukrainians to Crimea. It's not going to result in the capture of Crimea in the very near term. I think that's a very fair assessment, right? And this then begs the question of how do we think about the future of this war? I had been of the mind and for a long time had been arguing that this is a long war and it's going to be a longer war. There's, there were not going to be any shortcuts the way you aptly framed at the beginning of this conversation, right? There were not going to be any easy outs. Large-scale conventional wars are contests of wills. They often come down to wars of attrition. Leaders tend to mobilize their resources. And the longer a war like this goes on, the harder it is to end. It's hard to accept compromise. You have casualties on both sides. Societies end up sacrificing their great losses, and leaders are unwilling to then end the war. And you end up in a place where Ukraine is not going to make compromises, not certainly not the ones that are that are Russia's opening bids for negotiation, which is essentially accept the fact that I've annexed your territory. And Russia, at least at this stage, is not in a position where it has to compromise. And one of the things I was criticizing in the run-up to the offensive, and, and I'll kind of conclude on this thought, is, is there was a notion for some, the offensive was a key step towards Ukrainian military victory. For others, it was clear to me in conversation that the point of the offensive was to put Ukraine in a better negotiating position. And I sort of asked, negotiation uh, for what? Because if the offensive was very successful, then I was confident Ukraine was not going to negotiate. Why would Zelensky snatch defeat from the jaws of victory? And why would the Ukrainian public start negotiating with their own country, their own territory, as though they were looking at it as a map laid out on a table. If you're, if you're winning and you're taking back your territory, why would you negotiate the rest of way on the cusp of success? You'd only go back to the United States and to other countries and ask for more instruments to win. And if it wasn't successful, then why would the Russians negotiate? Why would Putin negotiate if he felt that he had withstood what was likely to be I would say not the greatest effort, but at least if he withstood what was likely to be the most significant offensive the Ukraine could mount in this war, which this may well be. It's not Ukraine's only shot at it, but it's arguably Ukraine's best shot at it right now. Uh, he would also feel confident that he could just extend the war and drag it on and pursue a strategy of not just attrition, but also exhaustion. And that may be where this is going. Hey, everybody, just wanted to take a minute away from the conversation to remind you that if you want to listen to parts two and three of this conversation, head on over to warontherocks.com slash membership, where you will gain access to all of Mike's shows on the Russia contingency, as well as our other podcasts, The Warcast, The Insider, and Unspent Rounds, along with our newest newsletter, Mid-Afternoon Map, which is a cartographic perspective on geopolitics. And with that, back to the show. Yeah, Mike, so, so of course, we have to be humble. If we were calling, let's say, World War II on the Eastern Front in real time, right. we, we would have said a lot of stupid things. We would have talked about the German victory. Then we would have talked about the, uh, the fact that Germany was supposed to collapse. Right. So there was no German victory, uh, even though they rolled so deep into Soviet territory. Right. They, they almost took Leningrad. They almost took Moscow. They did take Kiev. Uh, they were right there at Stalingrad. It's just astonishing. And yet they, th there was no victory there for them. And then instead of disintegrating, they fought on for two years in what looked like a lost cause to many uh, before the war finally ended. So let alone all the individual battles we would have called wrongly in real time then. Even the, just a larger picture would have been very difficult for two guys with a, with a microphone on each end. To have gotten right. So we're, you, you've you been very careful to caveat everything you've said. And, and we're too impatient in general in our culture, demanding results, demanding an understanding in real time of processes that are deeper and longer. Okay, so we've said that. But, but one of the problems we now have, Mike, as you know, is uh, coming up with the reasons, or if you prefer, the, the excuses for why the counteroffensive has not been successful so far. Never mind that we could have multiple counteroffensives here. Never mind that there could be another counteroffensive in the fall. That's very different. And never mind that the Russians could mount a counteroffensive, even though it doesn't look like it, right? But already we're in a discussion about who's at fault here. 
about what went wrong. And what we're hearing predominantly, although not exclusively, as you know, is the Ukraine's Western supporters, especially and including the U.S., push the Ukrainians into a counteroffensive without giving them the weapons, the wherewithal to pull this off. So you go take your territory back, you go fight a combined arms operation, you go fight against those entrenched Russian defenses that have had six months to dig in. And by the way, you know, we, we can't give you this and we can't give you that and we can't give you this, but, but go for it anyway. So we're beginning to hear that the, that the, the cause here is not the difficulty of the proposition, how difficult it is to evict an army that is substantial in size with substantial munitions and, and, and other material and is on the defensive rather than on the offensive, right? It's not the proposition itself that's, that's the challenge. It's the failure for us to supply the thing. So let's go through some of the things. All right, we didn't send them tanks. We hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed and said, no, we're not going to do it. Finally, we agreed and we sent them the modern tanks. So they had some leopards. They also had the armored vehicles, right? The, the Bradleys. And then they launched the counteroffensive in July with the leopards and the, the Bradleys. And after 36 hours, the Leopards and the Bradleys that they put into action are now in Poland in the workshops, and they're trying to recover what's left of them to see if they can go back into the battlefield. So you could argue, you know, tanks, I don't know how long you think they last on a battlefield like this, maybe 10 days, maybe 14 days if you're, if you're fortunate, if you're doing well, that your tank is going to last. Right in World War II on the Eastern Front, if your tank lasted four, four and a half days, you were in good shape. Right? 98% of all the tanks on the Eastern Front were lost and destroyed, and most of them lost and destroyed in the first week that they were put out there. So, okay, so the tank question, and then we have the F-16 question. So we're supposed to give them, I don't know how many F-16s, 20, 24, 30, and that's supposed to have decisively changed the battlefield, even though... The Russians have air defenses, which are on Russian soil, not on Ukrainian-occupied territory by Russia. And they have these S-300s and S-400s, as you know. And they have a very substantial inventory of those missiles for the S-300s and S-400s. They've been using them offensively, let alone defensively, as you know. And so explain to me how the F-16s were going to master the battlefield without knocking out the massive anti-aircraft that Russia has deployed. And then we could just keep going and going and going on the scapegoating of, or the failure to deliver the weapons in real time, uh, the weapons more quickly on the battlefield. Never mind that Ukrainians have absorbed years and years, more than a decade versus of javelin production, that they absorbed all the munitions we could find and then we couldn't find any more and we had to send the the... the the cluster ones, which uh, were contra morally controversial, but otherwise we had nothing left to give. So we've been giving and giving and giving, and instead the discussion is about how we're not giving. We're not giving fast enough. We're not giving quickly enough. And therefore, it's our fault, not the Ukrainian fault. How do you manage uh, that conversation, Mike? You're, you're, you've been to the battlefield multiple times. You understand these weapon systems. I mean, the honest answer is with great difficulty, right? Because as an analyst, on the one hand, I have a duty to be objective and to speak for the facts. On the other hand, I am not neutral. I care about the outcome of this war. I'm very much on Ukraine's side. I'm originally okay. from Ukraine. Every time I go back to Kiev, I go back to where I was born. And uh, it, it very much matters to me. That said... And I also appreciate that, look, facts don't speak for themselves. They need someone to speak on their behalf. And so for me, it's often a challenge in, in how we discuss this to both be objective, to be balanced, and also to figure out what are the what is the right time to discuss different aspects of what is happening in this war and to not be callous in what you disclose, especially since folks like me do do field work and do field research. And we're always cognizant of whether something we're saying may unduly or necessarily hurt Ukraine's war effort. 
inevitably this bickering amongst allies and partners, right? In any allied endeavor, uh, when things are not going to plan, you're going to get finger pointing, right? Unsurprisingly, I see a whole host of scapegoating that takes place. And now I see probably several weeks worth of, of more negative media coverage, particularly in Western media, which is a whiplash effect. And I, and I will be frank, the reason for this whiplash effect is because in the initial breaching attempt, which was not successful by Ukrainian forces, I think folks duly stood back and decided to be patient and wait and give it time. But quite a few weeks had passed while U.S. officials had said that this is fine, Ukrainian forces still have most of their combat strength, and there's nothing to judge the offensive by. And this conversation eventually created a real distance, or at least uh, you could see a real difference between how things were being discussed in public versus the sentiments that I had heard voice in other circles. And eventually this started to spill out into the media as a whiplash effect, right? It sort of caught up to what one could see much earlier than, let's say, two, three months into the offensive. Looking at the different claims being made, first, it is very fair to say that Western countries, including the United States, for varying reasons, missed key decision points in this war to mobilize defense industrial production, to provide Ukrainian forces with training at scale, and to provide them with munitions or equipment that they could have used to have had a decisive impact at certain turning points. I will point the finger on the more long-term decision points, specifically at Europeans, because they waited a very long time in this war to mobilize production, or sorry, to invest in the production of artillery and the air defense munitions, and essentially watched as the United States steadily depleted its stockpiles for a substantial period of this war before making those decisions to the point that in order to make this offensive work, the United States had to borrow artillery ammunition from South Korea and then had to dig into the cluster munition stockpile to change policy, Steve, which we very much did not want to do. And actually, part of the reasons, ironically, why we didn't want to do it is because of the concerns, the moral concerns of European allies who put us in that position in the first place, right? This is sort of the, uh, the irony of the whole thing. Beyond that conversation, the truth is that while many of the decisions made by the United States and, and other Western countries, some due to undue concerns over escalations, some due to a failure to appreciate the lead time for things or or when you have to make these calls to really affect the war effort. Uh, and, and they structured Ukrainian choices. That is a fair argument by Ukrainians, that it structured their choices and limited what they could do and when they could do it. And also the rules that came with U.S. weapons. For example, you can't use them to strike Russian territory. Or you can use them to strike Crimea, but that's kind of a corner case because it's not clear that you can strike the Kerch Strait Bridge or certain other infrastructure in Crimea. And, you know, like you need a law degree to figure out what are the exact rules for what you can do with U.S. missiles and which missile can be used for what thing. And the Brits and French gave them storm shadow, right? But it's not clear what restrictions those come with. I myself don't know what, what the specific rules are pertaining to those missiles. And so there's all these nuances and complexities. On the other hand, and, and it's just my own view, this is fundamentally Ukraine's war. The core decisions regarding this war have been made by Ukrainian military and political leadership, right? particularly political leadership, and executed by the Ukrainian military. And, and this pertains to the military strategy being employed behind the offensive, the timing for the offensive. It is erroneous to believe that the United States tells Ukraine what to do, but that the United States can tell Ukraine where the offensive should be, when it should start. Yes, the United States can try. It can try to suggest. It's clear there's joint wargaming that takes place. It's clear that it's not just the United States, but actually our British allies who are significantly involved as well. Okay. And yes, the United States and other countries are significantly involved in terms of intelligence support uh, in this war effort, probably more so than I've ever seen the United States involved in any war where we did not have boots on the ground, where our own forces were not involved. I mean, maybe the closest analogy is the Iran-Iraq war. And, and even that, I, I think, is a, is a distant comparison. But all that being said, you know, it's important, I think, that, that when fingers are pointed, that at the end of the day, we appreciate this joint, o- joint ownership of both success to some extent, with, with the bulk of that being uh, thanks to Ukraine's effort, but also when things don't go to plan and offensive doesn't deliver or isn't as successful as people expected, 
right? That it doesn't immediately deteriorate into finger pointing with each side trying to completely absolve itself of any responsibility for the choices made. I will bottom line it by saying that it was clear early on that Western equipment was important but wasn't going to be the decisive factor, okay? That the right conversation has to do with provision of uh, training, that it has to do with provision of key supporting capabilities of enablers, that it has to do with the aggregate numbers that is being able to provide substantial amount of artillery ammunition or air defenses and air defense munitions and scaling the effort. And as as the offensive unfortunately showed, look, you can't create brigades in the in the span of a few months and then put them in the lead of such a complex task with uh, limited enablers and easily expect success. And I, and I don't mean I don't mean to say that folks folks thought this would go easy, but I think there were a whole host of assumptions potentially made on what you could accomplish with freshly mobilized personnel, with uh, officers pieced together from other units and with a modicum of Western training. And maybe part of that was due to how well the Ukrainians did in, in adopting and integrating Western equipment over the course of the past year. But there are certain things that you can't just that easily rush, creating cohesive units, training command staffs, and getting a lot of uh, what you need in, in terms of uh, training done to get units to fight effectively uh, at that platoon, company, battalion level, and what have you. So I've talked about this actually extensively in, in prior editions of podcasts. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. But what I do want to say is that I'm very wary of uh, what, what I think are, to some extent, uh, alibis, which is to say if there were just F-16s, I don't know how many F-16s one can, one can imagine being involved, that they're talismanic and they would have uh, dramatically changed the outcome. And the answer is that, to me, a lot of the effects being associated with uh, Western platforms, okay, are largely come down to their employment, all the enabling capabilities that the United States has, the organizational capacity, the experience, and Ukraine can develop those over time, but they are not arrived at quickly. And we should be careful of the simple answers, the easy solutions being preferred to, to a war like this, and folks always looking for shortcuts, you know, see, uh, the game changers, the silver bullets that, that folks always looked as the next thing. These are long-term transition programs, right? These are efforts to enable Ukraine to develop an entire capacity and, and to be able to, to switch to not just Western platforms, but also to be able to adopt a lot of the tactics and approaches that Western militaries use in how they employ aviation. And that'll take time. It's a lot more than just learning to fly the F-16, just as learning to drive a Leopard 2 tank does not make you uh, an effective armored battalion and does not allow you to necessarily employ uh, an entire brigade in action or even a reinforced company in action with armored support and make that a cohesive effort. Yeah, Mike, you're fair. That's really fair. Let's continue to be fair here. So munitions supplies have been as much as we could based upon production levels. We should have done better with production. That's true before the war started, let alone during the war. It's true today as we speak on your show. Still, we have this problem. Okay, so, but we gave as much munitions as we could, and we're still doing that. Any aircraft, we certainly were slower, but once we figured out the anti aircraft problem, we supplied significant volume, significant numbers of anti aircraft, and it had a massive effect on the battlefield. There's no question. Now, could we have done more anti aircraft? Yes. Do we have more anti aircraft to give? That's a separate question, and that's about the, the industrial base that the West had in place and still has in place now, right? That's not about reluctance to give. That's about not getting rid of your military industrial complex because you thought the Cold War was over and conflict was over, right? Okay. You know, on the tanks, how many tanks and armored vehicles could we have given? 
maximalized, right? How much is the maximum we could have afforded to give and how decisive could that have possibly been on the battlefield? So instead of giving X number, if we had given 2X, would that have been decisive? Well, somebody's got to drive the tank and somebody's got to manage the skilled infantry to retake the territory and to hold the territory. Uh, we didn't have a million soldiers with kit ready to go to give that. And we weren't going to give that. And so you can give the tanks, but where's the other stuff that make the tanks valuable for the 10 or 14 days that they function on the battlefield, right? So this conversation, to be fair, you got to be fully fair all the way about what the possible effects would have been if we had done what the people are blaming the West for not having done so far. A, whether it was possible, and B, if it wasn't possible, but we still did it, it would have had those effects that they're claiming it would have had. But let's let, let's be fair to the administration. Their uh, priority goal has been not just preventing a defeat of Ukraine. Their priority goal, not just making sure that Ukraine remains an independent, sovereign country in control of itself. Their goal has been no wider war. And they've been very clear about that, no wider war. And you can argue whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, but we have not had a wider war. And so you rarely get credit for something that doesn't happen. If we had had a wider war and we were in a wider war and there were American boots on the ground and German boots on the ground, and you could go on with this conversation. Or if the war had spread to Africa uh, as it threatened not that long, just a couple of weeks ago uh, with the coup in Niger, or if it had spread to Iran or the Caucasus or you, you fill in the blank there, right? The thing that I got most wrong in my view about this whole war was that I predicted that something else would happen outside of just Ukraine, that other powers would try to take advantage of the situation or that events would just happen and it would change the context in which the Ukraine war was happening, right? So in other words, stuff would happen, predictable or unpredictable, and that this would change the equation. I, I, I got that wrong. I, I constantly was thinking, what would happen? What could change the situation? What could change the context? What could put Ukraine into a much larger and more difficult context rather than just the difficulties already that were sufficient? Okay. It, we, we still could have that, unfortunately, right? We still could have that wider war. We still could have those events elsewhere that change the larger context and calculus and commitment and supply. Okay, so I've been wrong on that, but in the fullness of time, we'll see. But the fact that there's been no wider war has been a policy. That's been a goal that's been pursued. And you can argue it was wrong. Uh, in other words, that they were too cautious. But you can't argue that they didn't try to prevent a wider war. And the fact that no wider wars happen is, is not necessarily a bad thing. So in the discussions where we're going around on the finger pointing, as you called it, and we're saying if we had done this, if we had done that, if we had done this, we let the Ukrainians go on an offensive without sufficient equipment. If, if we had done better, they'd be in a better place. And so it's kind of on us. It has to, fairly, it has to be put in this context of the pursuit of avoiding at all costs a wider war, especially because we see the softness of support for continued Western support in the United States and elsewhere for this war of attrition, as you called it. It's soft without the wider war. Would it have been softer even still with a wider war? We don't know because that's a counterfactual, but we can't take that off the table as if that wasn't a consideration for Washington or Berlin or other capitals. I think that's a fair point, that escalation management was an imperative. It certainly was an imperative for the administration, right? The effective criticism that I've heard for the course of this war is that early on, they led that imperative to be relatively disarming in that, that they not pursue a whole host of material assistance and support that they could have, and that they were deterred 
by the threat of escalation, the fear of escalation, and that this was undue. I think that some of that criticism, particularly in the first six months of the war, is quite fair. Second, that they were not sufficiently vested in Ukrainian victory. That is, they felt that they had avoided or averted the worst possible outcome when the Russian initial invasion failed, and that they believed that they had already attained a strategic defeat for Russia, and their second concern was escalation management. And the way I thought of it, sort of the where I thought the administration really was, is I was trying to balance between three parts of a triangle. This is the way kind of I intellectually framed it for myself. The first is strategic defeat for Russia. They felt that they had largely accomplished this as a failure by the Russian leadership to achieve their war aims, even their most minimal sort of political aims in this war, such as capturing the Donbass, destroying Ukraine's statehood. The second was victory for Ukraine. And this was largely left for Ukraine to define, and Ukraine defined it as uh, restoring territorial control and restoring territorial control of territory that includes Crimea. Although, you know, I think I think arguably they might have been open to taking back everything going back to 2014 and forcing Russia, Russia to some sort of negotiation in Crimea. But the how is not the important conversation, right? The important conversation is the, what the end goal was. And the third was escalation management, right? There's uh, av- avoiding nuclear escalation and avoiding a degree of horizontal escalation that drew uh, NATO into the conflict, which could then also potentially lead you down the path of nuclear escalation. And there were lots of debates to what extent People were overly concerned about nuclear escalation, not enough con- concern, not sufficiently concerned about nuclear escalation, depending on what period of the war you, you analyze. And I think the, the criticism, or not the criticism, but maybe the observation might be that the administration focused much more on uh, ensuring a strategic defeat for Russia and on averting escalation and less so prioritizing victory for Ukraine. I no, mean, I think that may will be a fair criticism. I'm just I'm just saying that that's the way I see the things that that Washington was trying to balance. All right, let's take that. Let's take that point then. Let's take this victory for Ukraine piece, right? So you don't get credit for avoiding escalation if escalation doesn't happen. People say you were overly cautious. You could have done more. You were too much afraid of escalation and you failed to deliver more in real time. Because look, escalation hasn't happened, right? So in other words, it's one of those impossible arguments that you can't falsify one way or the other. But on the victory for Ukraine piece, what in the world would victory look like for Ukraine? And remember, I need to win the peace, not just win the war. So I'm with you. I want Russia to pay a price for this criminal aggression. The Ukrainians deserve whatever they have earned on that battlefield and and in their sacrifices and doing the dirty work that they're doing while we're having a discussion on a podcast, right? Okay, I'm with that. But let's define victory here. Because if you define victory, my definition of victory is accession into the European Union and security guarantee. Probably the second has to come before the first. So if you get a security guarantee, and you get a pathway to European Union accession. In other words, if you join the West, right? Ukraine is not trying to join the international rules-based order. It's not trying to join something abstract. It's trying to join the West. And it wants a security guarantee. And it wants EU accession. And in fact, that's why people went out on the streets, as you know, in 2003-04 and overthrew their own domestic dictator, let alone a foreign occupier. That's why they did it again in 2014, sacrificing lives. Many people lost their lives in both the Orange Revolution 2003-04 and in 2014 to join the West. And so that remains the definition of victory as far as I can, I can understand it. So if that's the definition of victory, how do you fit the war into that definition of victory? In other words, do you need all your internationally recognized territory in order to gain EU accession and the security guarantee? Do you need war crimes tribunals on the Russian leaders in order to get EU accession and a security guarantee, right? What do you need, Mike, to achieve victory the way that I think I'm defining it? And moreover, you have to achieve that victory in the fullness of time, winning the peace, right? 
So we could talk about the Russian regime and Prigozhin and all those other things that are no doubt on your mind as well as mine. And I think we will. But in the meantime, you, you're going to have a different Russian regime when Putin dies. Is that Russian regime going to be incentivized or, or disincentivized to do this again? Right. In other words, how do you come up with an endurable peace, a peace that endures over one generation, two generations, and not say, oh, you know, they're going to do this again. People say, oh, let's make Ukraine into Israel. Let's make it a garrison state. But as you know, Mike, that has implications for your domestic institutions, right, for what kind of domestic institutions you might have for what type of relationship with the EU you might have if you're an arm to the teeth garrison state what is that a more desirable outcome than incentivizing your neighbor your larger neighbor not to do this again in some form right so when you talk about the triangle which you laid out really nicely strategic defeat for Russia that's there that's clearly there avoiding escalation that's there. That's clearly there. That's two big pieces that you've got on the table. And then Ukrainian victory. That's not there. In fact, Ukraine needs Ukraine. Russia doesn't need Ukraine. That's our problem here, Mike. Right? Russia has Russia. They don't need Ukraine, but Ukraine doesn't have another place. So getting to the victory in that piece was always going to be the harder one. And I'm not sure if being riskier on the escalation stuff or on the strategic defeat for Russia stuff, because that's pretty much a similar piece, right? Even though I agree that they're not identical. Was that the way to a Ukrainian winning of the peace, not winning things on the battlefield? Thanks again, everybody, for listening to this sneak preview of the Russia contingency. If you want to listen to parts two and three, head on over to warontherocks.com slash membership and sign up today.